digital is a business enabler around driving sustainable growth and it's done through aggregating demand so think like the Expedia example, like take all of these non-digital things rather like planes or hotel or whatever and aggregate that demand, make it discoverable by people and then capture that demand by making it a really great commerce experience, by making it a really great engagement experience. So you have an account and you keep coming back. It's a very different thing than like, than what our IT organization does. They work on core infrastructure, making sure the trains are running on time, making sure that we've got uptime in our core platform. It's not necessarily about servicing demand from a patient or consumer standpoint. Now we're having a straight out 100% live conversation uh, with Sara Vaizi from uh, Providence up in up in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, I, I I do apologize at, about how grim the title of this uh, is. How are our digital health leaders an endangered species? But we really just wanted to 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 focus in on a truth that there are lots of challenges today that that healthcare is not immune to the, the to the squeezing of these capital markets, and there are a lot of people out there doing great work that might be subject to layoffs or uh, subject to reduction in roles or have to, having to reduce their own departments and things like that. And uh, what I thought was, was really exciting and valuable to, talk, uh, to speak with Sara about is just in her experience uh, founding the Digital Innovati Innovation Group at Providence and leading hundreds of digital efforts and projects and things like that, and also uh, uh, being chief strategy and digital officer. So uh, combining the, 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 the strategic and the digital side, I felt like she had a unique vision into the, the types of things that healthcare organizations value from a business and system level. And this conversation could be really helpful in, in terms of identifying what those patterns are, what, what's needed to think from like a growth and leadership perspective for the types of digital, in, uh, uh, digital innovations for, for our patient populations. And of course, uh, at the center of that is understanding not just the impact from a business perspective, but all the way down to the individual consumer. So Sara, again, really excited to have you. Um, any thoughts or anything that you'd like to open with or, or let the audience know before we get into it? Uh, well, I'm just really excited and like no pressure, right? We are talking about endangered species, the collapse of a lot of um, components of American healthcare, which is really tough. and a live session. So hopefully I um, don't put my foot in my mouth and we have a good conversation and we have a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And, and yeah, we, we keeps it heavy up here apparently, but yeah. <laughs> I'm just really excited about the, the conversation, what, uh, what we're about to cover and uh, really just getting into it. I shared a little bit, I shared just a tiny bit of your, your background with regards to leading digital innovation efforts at, at Providence, but I mean, there's hot sauce in your life. There's all kinds of stuff. Uh, and I think that the audience needs to hear about your background. Do you mind sharing just a couple of words about yourself? Sure. So um, I'll, I'll kind of give you the, the dry resume stuff first, and then we'll talk about hot sauce, which is um, always fun. Uh, so I've been with Providence for seven and a half years. I um, have been in the digital team the whole time and added the sort of strategy uh, part to my role just about a year ago uh, last summer. I've spent the bulk of my career in healthcare or very close to healthcare. So prior to coming to Providence, I was in, um, I worked in a small management consulting firm focusing on uh, population health work and um, enterprise strategy. I built a couple of companies with large integrated delivery networks, um, primarily focused in the population health space, which was really interesting and actually a great ex uh, experience leading into what I've been doing now. And uh, before that, I worked in health policy and health services research. So I uh, worked with a lot of agencies in Washington State, which is where I live today, but also lived at the time um, and where I've grown up and uh, did a lot of work in you know early days of like high tech um, and uh, a lot of work in the earlier days of medical homes, especially like designing medical homes for Medicaid insured people in our state. And um, 
And then uh, uh, before that, I was a um, biomedical researcher. So I worked as an engineer and scientist at a um, medical device company that does therapeutic ultrasound work and had done therapeutic ultrasound research for uh, all throughout college and after college. So that was like several years of my life as well. And, um, and so I just, I love healthcare. I love the kind of science. Um, I love the quantitative aspects of it and have uh, just really care about what we're doing. So, um, so that's sort of my, you know, uh, career slash school background um, at Providence. What we do a lot of is enabling the the sort of front end for the system and making it um, work for our patients and our consumers to the extent that we, you know, can help improve um, uh, accessibility, engagement, sort of information, um, affordability, you know, so we're working on a lot of those things across marketing, digital experience, and our innovation efforts with respect to creating new companies. So that's what I do at work. And then um, we also have, I have a small family run hot sauce company with my partner um, in life and in business, I guess. <laughs> and uh, it's very much a family affair. So, you know, we we make hot sauce and our five-year-old son helps us pack and fulfill and we have a great time doing it. So <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I love it. And I, I have to say a Renaissance woman in terms of strategy, digital and hot sauce. That That's, that's exciting to hear. Uh, such a diverse background. One thing I like to do before we get get deep into it too is I noticed that we've said digital a whole lot and we've said strategy a whole lot at this point. Could you start with the basics on what is this totally. stuff that we're talking about? You know, it's actually, um, I think it's a really important question, partly because um, one, especially in the digital domain, like you ask one chief digital officer, you've asked, you've talked with one and the perspectives are very different because it's relatively quickly evolving and relatively new to the technology, uh, to the healthcare space. Um, and uh, I'll start there, which is like the way that we define digital. And uh, we've spent a lot of time actually building sort of a thesis around digital and where it can have the most needle moving potential within the context of healthcare. And that's what we've done and how we differentiate it from things like uh, what our chief information officer does or what other teams do within the system. And um, what we're fundamentally focused on when it comes to digital is what other industries who are non-digitally native have done to make a digital transformation. So in our mind, it's fundamentally about um, digital is a business enabler around driving sustainable growth, and it's done through essentially aggregating demand, make it discoverable by people, and then um, capture that demand by making it a really great commerce experience, by making it a really great engagement experience. So you have an account and you keep coming back. That's the traditional playbook of digital transformation. And that's how we've thought about it. That's the, um, that's our playbook. So when we say digital, that's what we mean. And it's a very different thing than like, than what our um, IT organization does. They work on core infrastructure. It's not necessarily about servicing demand from a patient or consumer standpoint. So that's how we define digital. Um, and then on the strategy side of things, strategy to me is fundamentally about um, doing two things. One is making choices because you have limited resources and you can't do it all. And two, it's about ensuring that your choices aren't what everybody else is choosing to do as well. So it's differentiated. That's fundamentally what it is. And really solid strategies um, we'll set organizations apart if folks have read things like Good to Great or sort of foundational business books. Um, they are about what do you know as an organization that allows you to be the best at something um, versus like just doing the same thing that everybody else does. A lot of um, a lot of strategy in all many organizations in all, across many industries kind of is like motherhood and apple pie, and that's the opposite of strategy. That's planning. Planning is fine, right? Like here are the steps I'm going to take. I want to, you know, be a really solid organization. And um, that's great, but that's not differentiated answering a couple of questions and making really significant choices. Well, thank you for, uh, for, for, for providing that definition. And honestly, like even 
listening to your de uh, definition on digital, which involved uh, like an understanding of the, of the business enablers for growth, it really ties into the, to that thought and strategy. I actually hadn't heard it uh, described like that before. And, you know, if you were to ask me about digital being, you know, data science as well, I'll talk about ones and zeros and things like that. But the, the much more important question uh, that you're seeking to ask with digital, if you're starting from that perspective, is how do these uh, how do these approaches help us to enable growth? So I'm really thankful that that you framed it in that way. Uh, you outlined the, those basics, that, ba that basic formulation of digital and strategy. Could you talk about how that translates into the work that you do in your focus? Kind of, I often ask about what's a day in the life, but I know a day is really different every day. So can you talk about like a quarter in the life of a uh, chief digital and strategy officer? Absolutely. I mean, I think we're trying to, by the way, move these things in parallel. Digital, data, AI, um, you know, these types of things are core to our strategy going forward. And so we've spent quite a bit of time um, integrating the uh, integrating digital and strategy in service to the broader mission of the organization and how we serve our communities. So um, they may seem like very distinct things, but they're uh, they're not. Um, and so, you know, what we um, what we spend, you know, on the strategy side, um, because I've been sort of, um, I would say, newer in this um, in this role, and frankly, it's a it's a sort of newer orientation to a strategy role within a health system in that I'm not focused um, on how our ministries, we call all of our hospitals and the surrounding communities like ministries, how they perform. We've got a, an amazing CSO who um, focuses on care delivery and sort of our traditional um, uh, way that we serve. In addition to that, we've got where is the direction of where we need to go? How do we manage the transition economics from where we are today to how we are going to do it in the future? So we've been spending a lot of time like laying that out and saying, what do we think the future of healthcare is going to look like? Uh, when we talk about demand, for instance, like the nature of demand, the nature of supply, how they interact um, is changing quite a bit, especially uh, catalyzed by COVID, of course, over the last three years, like a lot has changed. Um, and uh, and so it's important for us to continue to take those types of things into account and think about what it, you know our goalposts of um, of what we're working toward and what we think our organization as well as it, within the context of the broader environment is going to look like. Um, a key part of that is that we believe that we need to move upstream in in a, in our organ you know in the broader ecosystem from a uh, from a financing standpoint from a navigation standpoint and from uh, an integration standpoint across data and digital networks and so th so that we can help um, support our communities um, in an over from an overall health status perspective rather than exclusively from the delivery of sort of last mile care and and so we've, we've been laying that out and then building our Providence sort of uh, digital vision um, associated with that as well. So quarterly, you know, what that looks like is working really closely to get more and more refined around what we mean with this very high level direction, working with stakeholders across our entire organization from our board and our sponsors uh, to management, to frontline folks, really getting, getting the organization to provide their feedback, their understanding, and, you know, kind of work with us on this direction. And then on the digital side of things, um, and it's really digital and marketing because it's, you know, marketing is about how you ensure that there's awareness of your services within a community and that folks can actually engage with the, the buy those services. I use that term sort of loosely because of, you know, the nature of how healthcare is engaged in, but marketing is really essential to in awareness and making sure that we have, uh, our communities have access. And then digital experience, a lot of this happens in the digital sphere. So on um, in the search experience, on our websites, on our mobile experiences, and then um, within our incubation efforts around building new technologies, all of those work in service to that getting upstream goal. 
for the strategy. So the, the um, you know, we work to get stakeholders aligned and then we build experiences and technology in service to that. So that's what every quarter, you know, kind of looks like. It's like we lay out very specific products that we're building and that we're taking to market. We have roadmaps around it. We have KPIs that we clearly define and we stick to, right? So we're not just sort of like loosey goosey about these things. And then we are tremendously execution focused. Um, it's, uh, we've built, um, we've done three cycles, for instance, of um, incubation related efforts uh, where we either built a company or we sold a product to a company that is now out there in the market. We're on our fourth and we have to be execution and like just completely like maniacally focused on delivery um, in order to be able to do that. Same with what our marketing team does, which they don't build, they don't build new companies, but they maniacally service our ministries, our divisions, our regions um, to ensure that our customers can find us and that they can get the services when they need them. Just uh, so I've got a lot of questions from that, uh, but I am very curious about any kind of examples, what company you, you're, you, you'd be most intrigued to share that has been built and then sold through this process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll give one example, which folks out there may know about. Um, it's a company called Dexcare, which is led by two gentlemen that we um, we brought in as entrepreneurs when we were, you know, after the product had been developed and they run the company. Um, Derek Street is the CEO. Sean O'Connor is the chief commercial officer. And it's a company that's focused um, in the access, they call it access optimization category. Um, and access optimization is fundamentally, like when you talk about it with the Dexcare team, um, it's about three things. The first is discovery. So again, ensure that in a, in an environment where access and like the services that are available to a patient or a consumer are complex and they may be fragmented, make that discovery experience really smooth and easy and frictionless. The second thing that it does is um, navigate patients or consumers to the right option based on um, data-driven intelligence. So, Chris, this is in your your domain, of, and uh, and they uh, based on what they know about consumer intent and preference and motivation, based on what they know about clinical appropriateness, based on what they know about the operations of a health system, they'll navigate the patient. And then the third thing is matching supply to demand. So you don't want to navigate folks to a venue or modality of care, virtual or physical, that doesn't have capacity, right? That's a terrible experience. And so that's what DexCare does. It's fundamentally those three things. And they optimize access and drive sustainable growth for health systems um, through this, this kind of these three steps. So we um, incubated that company. We um, we founded it in approximately, well, we started working on the technology in approximately 2017. Um, and then in 2021, Derek and Sean um, took the company out, raised independent venture capital. They just announced actually a couple of weeks ago their Series C. Um, so they've raised about $150 million to date. We as Providence um, are uh, customers. We use their platform, but we also are, um, we have a bit of equity in the company. And, um, but really what's important to us is the strategic value that we get out of these organizations because they are designed to, and they're built with the health system problems in mind. So we got really deep on the problem and we really understood it. And then we're able to, um, you know, kind of build an MVP product that we were using. And then now they've taken it to the next level and really professionalized the company independent from our four walls. Thank you. I, I just like the way that that highlights using the uh, the problems and challenges that that y'all were aware of to to build out a platform exactly. like that. Exactly. So one thing that 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 also really stood out was uh, the importance that you placed on KPIs in that previous answer, and that just made me think about how a lot of what's what's happening out of digital departments are seen as nice to haves. Totally. And one thing I was hoping that people would be able to get out of this conversation was kind of a framework on what helps elevate from that nice, nice to have status to things, to things that are vital for, for business operations. And there's a, uh, a study that just came out from uh, Rock Health where they investigated digital health funding. As awesome as a lot of the new technology that, that's coming out is, funding for uh, digital health in 2022 was about half of what it was in 2021. 
So just being being in strategy and, and your position, I'm just curious about what are your thoughts on, I guess, a framework to, to go from that nice to have to that more upstream importance uh, category for digital leaders? So um, I think it all fundamentally comes down to, we call it roadie, return on digital investment. Uh, we have a similar uh, metric on our marketing side, Romi, return on marketing investment. And um, within the context of marketing, Romi is quantified in terms of incremental dollars that we generate for our system that we wouldn't have otherwise gotten. We've generated via our marketing efforts, 2 billion incremental dollars for the system for, for folks. And the way that we've done it is not by generating artificial demand, but it's by um, understanding how folks like based on a lot of data that we have about folks that they all that they needed clinical services and we help them convert into the system through things like targeted outbound outreach messaging emails that kind of thing so that's one way right that's in the marketing sense it's very very like quantified in the form of dollars in the form of digital we also do that for for the roadie metric and we are now getting really precise about how we can quantify it over multiple categories. For instance, efficiencies uh, like around uh, volumes in our contact centers. We don't necessarily, if we can take some of the burden off of our contact centers for calls around things that frankly they shouldn't have to deal with, like password resets or you know silly things that is not the highest and best use of their time they can then dedicate their um, resourcing to other things that are that are the highest and best use of their time so things like efficiencies things like system uptime which we have quantified a value associated with with why uptime is important for the technical infrastructure and then access and revenue so how many folks got care um, through the digital platforms that we have that they wouldn't have otherwise gotten. Again, they, they converted better. They found something that they wouldn't have found, found otherwise because it would have been buried somewhere. So we quantify that category. And then the third, the fourth category is essentially like lifetime value or long-term value capture that we get through um, relationships that we build and connectivity that we have for our users across our ecosystem as well as an external ecosystem. So we have like those four big categories and we give dollar amounts to each of those. We also look at how many people we're just serving, right? Like our reach into our communities, um, how many folks get clinically appropriate services that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten, you know, those types of things really matter. And so when we have that quantification, we're able to um, really make a case for why it's important for the system. And it's balancing sort of the purely financial case with the access case and the mission case that we have um, uh, all the time. So, um, so, so that's part of it. We also have a lot of like what we call kind of input metrics, things like um, how many transactions were done digitally and what's the growth rate of that like looking like, you know, that's an expectation that exists in all sorts of other industries around having the option, for instance, to book your um, plane tickets, right? Like most people le leverage online sources to buy plane tickets. They also, you know, we're also getting that option available online scheduling for patients within the healthcare context, right? Um, so transactions, uh, registering users on digital platforms. So getting folks online with us via registration, um, account creation, that kind of thing. And then the last metric that we have, actually there are others too, but it's a really important one is around monthly active usage or weekly active usage, depending on how um, the appropriateness of the use case. But those input metrics around monthly active usage, which is how often someone engages with us digitally um, within a given month, like how many users do that. Um, all of those tell us how behaviors are um, driving some of those ultimate metrics around roadie. Um, and so we do those things and then we tie them back to business objectives, right? That's the key one. They don't just stand alone. Um, and, and we tell the story, uh, continuously because, um, 
uh, as one of my mentors has uh, often stated, uh, change management is like a slowly leaking balloon. You got to reinflate it all the time. You got to tell your story all the time. And so um, we do that a lot. We engage with um, all the different parts of our organization and we do a lot of external stuff so that we can convey the you know, connectivity between the input metrics, the output metrics, and the business objectives. Could you talk about how you worked with your uh, leadership team and your peers to get them to accept those as the uh, viable metrics? Because I, I know that there's a lot of debate about, around which KPIs matter and how they were calculated. And I hope, it, you know, any, anybody who's watching who is at a, uh, perhaps at a digital health company and all that really listened into that, th those, those return metrics, because it's, it's extremely important uh, to come up with, uh, not just come up with numbers, but make sure that they're done in a way that people with the financial backgrounds and backings trust and really pour over. So curious about what your uh, path was in, in getting organizational agreement on some metrics like that. Um, so they, uh, it, dif it kind of differs depending on what specific uh, initiative or team or vertical that we're talking about. Um, but I can give a couple of examples. There's almost always a triad that we have to engage with. Clinical folks, operational folks, and financial folks, right? Like we have to have that triad that we engage with very systematically um, in order to make a case for something. Um, in the case of Romy, for instance, we um, engaged very, very deeply with our um, with our finance team to truly like validate, and they audited. They audited us on an annual basis, sometimes more often than an annual basis. They audit that it's truly incremental based on the data that we have and the um, and what we know about the users that are actually converting and getting the services that they otherwise would not have come to us because we run like an A-B test and we can show a control group versus um, a group that got an intervention, um, this, this sort of roaming related um, marketing efforts. So that's the finance aspect of it. On the clinical side of it, we work really closely to understand what the um, clinical uh, content, messaging, you know, the, uh, sort of accurate around all of the um, clinical appropriateness that leads to a campaign being developed in a very specific way. And then we work really closely with our operations folks to define, well, what are those clinical priorities in the first place? You know, how do you, how do you build a campaign that's consistent with, um, with, uh, on objectives of a region in terms of where they have capacity to serve and to grow and that kind of thing. So that triad is always there. On the um, digital platform side of things, the same thing. So those four categories of roadie that I mentioned to you, we develop those in collaboration with finance. We have um, we have operators that we work with to say within the digital platforms, for instance, what use cases matter most to you in order to get things like next best actions. We have something called next best action in front of a user and ensure that they are closing gaps of care or whatever. And then we work with our clinicians to say, okay, well, what's the most appropriate flag for those um, next best actions? How do we really surface up those individuals and, um, and get the right things in front of them to, that meets their needs the most? So it's always a collaboration. And then um, at, sort of at the ground level, and then we take those up and we work with our executive leadership committees, our strategy committee, and we process them with the board as well. Um, around the right metrics for the business that ladder up to what we call our highest level board level metrics in common. And those are metrics that every single person in the system is accountable for. So we ensure that our business metrics from a digital and marketing standpoint enable those metrics in common. Um, so one of our metrics in common, for instance, as an organization is patient served. So everything that we do, we say, well, we were able to reach this many people that ladders into this patient served metric. So we draw those connections very explicitly. That gets me thinking too about uh, the, the digital innovation group and the overall idea, like it, it can no longer be a nice to have when you have kind of that, when, when you unified around a North Star and you're really talking about all the significant contributions to that North Star and hopefully the things that don't work as well are, are being sliced out. 
So with, with your work with the Digital Innovation Group and working with uh, more than 150 health system partnerships and things like that, I thought you, you might have developed kind of a sniff test to know what some of those efforts are that, that might be doomed to fail. So just wondering about your, uh, y your thoughts on the type of stuff, the type of initiatives that you might've been excited about in the past, but learned that we've, we've got to cut this one before it gets too big. I don't know if I have like an answer to, to end all answers or anything like that on this one, but um, mostly because it's kind of hard to tell. And so um, I think what's even more important is to create a framework for testing um, and applying hypotheses and learning from them and then like fishing or cutting bait soon right? Um, rather than just letting things languish or doing so much like, you know, fancy schmancy strategic thinking up front, but never actually doing anything about it. Like, so you got to get in there, right? And I was, I was talking with some colleagues and they were saying, well, you know, we've got this product and how do we know what people are going to pay for it and whether they're willing to buy it and all that stuff. And I was like, nothing really spells like someone's willing to buy it. Like when they actually cut you a check, to the extent that you can like have rigor around developing an MVP and getting it out there. That's like the most important thing based like in an educated way that doesn't like agile doesn't mean that you just like crap all over process or that you're not thoughtful about it or you don't do the strategic thinking up front, but there are answers that you can't get until you're out there. So that's more what I would say is like test things out have a really, um, and you can't test everything. So have a really strong set of hypotheses around like, at least what are the things that you're trying to accomplish? What are your objectives? Um, what business levers or clinical levers or, um, you know, consumer facing um, problems are you trying to solve? And then get out there and start working on it. And then do like, state like have a lot of rigor all along the way um so don't just like come up with an idea start testing it and then assume that that's it right and then you can scale from there we have made that a mistake where we did some initial thinking that seemed right on and um when we started building a service and then like the regulatory environment changed and that had a huge amount of impact on our ability to actually do that work anymore and so, but we kept doing it, we kept doing it because we kind of had these, like, we were clinging to our old assumptions in a way without really responding to the changes that we, that were happening out there. And in some cases, like we should have been aware sooner, but we hadn't had built that process in systematically. And so we couldn't do it anyway, long story short, like just keep, keep refreshing your thinking. Um, the regulatory environment might change. The competitive environment might change patient or consumer needs might change. So just test, stay on top of the rigor associated with like how things are performing. And so that's more what I would say. It's really hard to like, um, it's, it's a little bit difficult to know like whether something is crap up front or not. It's hard to know, like, like that you can't stereotype all kinds of different capabilities and, and characteristics because there are different things that might have a different way of working with, with your population versus uh, your friends at another institution that, that's working with an entirely uh, different group of people. I, I think a, a really big takeaway from that is setting up an environment where uh, rather than spending huge amounts of time on just upfront without any kind of action, without any kind of mechanism to get information back on performance, maybe it, it's not that any specific app or uh, a digital health platform is doomed to fail. It's a strategy that doesn't learn from uh, what's Completely. happening in the market and listen to the patients. Exactly. You got it. You got it. So your thoughts in, in terms of learning about patients, learning about consumers and their needs, uh, what, what are some ways that, that you keep a pulse on the types of things that, that you should be focusing on for them next? One is, you know, we go through, we do go through a rigorous process of, uh, surfacing up like big problem areas that we know kind of at a high level, like conceptually, these are issues that folks need solved. And we surface that through a lot of primary and secondary research. We interview a lot of folks. We interview patients, we interview clinicians, we interview administrators within our own environment, outside of our environment, thought leaders, you know, so we just do a lot of like talking to folks, research, like that kind of thing. 
And that's at the highest level to say, like, what are the big pain points? Let's make sure that we're kind of aware of the broader market context and um, and uh, and that we're tackling the the big things. Right. Not maybe not. Maybe we don't get it right every time in terms of tackling the biggest thing, but we're at least trying to tackle the big things that really matter to people. Um, and then and then we start to get some theses around like what might be a solution and um, and start to do some light build and prototyping. And that's when we build in systems where we can we can test with users all along the way. So the most sophisticated version of that, like when we talk about our um, the work that we've done in marketing or the work that we've done in digital experience, um, digital um, incubation and digital experiences, we've built in systems where we can actually look at behavior across our digital platforms because we've instrumented a digital platform so that we understand how much like what's working for folks, how much are they engaging in a specific feature? And then like, how long do they stay on that specific feature? Because that might mean that it it actually matters to them and they find it more useful versus if they click on something and then they go away. Right. But those systems are complex to, um, to build. Um, and we do that at the point where we're really starting to like get serious about a platform and building it. In the middle, we also do a lot of usability testing where we just like record like, hey, show me like how you would go make an appointment with this platform or show me how you would go find a piece of content with this platform. And then we look, we we actually visually look and see how folks navigate their way through. They explain to us um, what they're doing and that helps us really understand, well, maybe this is more confusing than it needs to be, or there's sort of like usability, other usability issues. So, so we engage a lot of our patients and our users in the actual build process. We also um, do the same with our own folks within the context, like of our caregivers, we call everybody who works within the Providence environment caregivers. We test Um, we test with them. We build a lot of provider facing dashboards. We ask them to go use them. We do the same usability testing there. So there are different, um, different grades there. And then we're always doing AB testing, always doing it, just sort of running in the background, consistently improving our platforms so that we're um, meeting the needs the most. So it's kind of like those two big levels. There's like sort of the macro, like top down, are you tackling the biggest problems? And then there's the bottom up, like really understand behavior and how folks are interacting with something. For the for folks that might not be doing that or might not be engaging in that in that type, type of rigor, I hope it's some inspiration to take back to the market. But there, there's with that though, there, there's a big new behemoth uh, kind of technology, set of technologies and focus that, that's captured a lot of people's attention uh, for better and for worse in, in a lot of cases. Uh, our founder, uh, the founder of Wobot, Dr. Ali Darcy, she actually recently published a blog post called Science in the Loop, where it emphasizes that, hey, these technologies and things like that might be new, but we still need to ground ourselves and base our thinking in science. So mm-hmm. there's still scientific and ethical rigor that is needed before these types of things are healthcare grade. So just thinking back to, to, to that stiff test and how you evaluate technologies and I'm just wondering if anything ha- has changed or if uh, this paradigm of uh, various uh, generational uh, generative models ha- has uh, changed any of that thinking. So I have a lot of opinions, but I'm not an expert in this field. And we're, tr- we're leaning in super, super hard to try to get smart and to do something meaningful in the space while also adhering to uh, ethical, uh, security, equity, um, you know, all, like a lot, a set of guardrails around, uh, around this technology, uh, this whole category of technology, frankly. Um, and you know, it is quite hyped and there are some foundational still science problems associated, like scientific problems associated with it. Um, and you know, like the short-term memory problems that generative AI has, um, and like the lack of context that can have um, challenges and like how vector databases can so- solve for some of that, for instance, like there is a lot of science uh, as you get deeper on it, it may temper some of the hype, but I do think the hype in some cases is sort of worth paying attention to, right? Like the technology itself, you, uh, you articulated like foundation models. The technology itself is a lot more powerful than some of the historical technology that we've had. Artificial intelligence has been used for decades in various forms, but 
this category of technology is more powerful because of the foundation models and these neural networks that have been built. The second is like it is we are at the like sort of this inflection point in that the technologies are more performant than humans, which they haven't necessarily been in the past. And so the hype is in some cases worth it there. And then also just like it's taken the world by storm, right? So the adoption is unlike anything we've ever seen. And again, worth paying attention to one way or another. So with that in mind, like I think it's we're leaning in, like I said, like and it's very, very important to us, but that we lean in responsibly. We are an organization that has always felt like it's important to pay attention to the signs of the times. And it, this is another indicator of the signs of the times. But we're not experts. So some of the things, so we don't have what I would say is like a set a framework yet or a set of principles around the technology itself, but we're in the process of making those um, from a couple different angles. We've, um, we've uh, assembled a leadership group that is from across the system so that we can bring in, we can ultimately focus on the problems we're trying to solve and then use a data ethics group and an information security group so that from a data ethics and sort of equity and uh, you know perspective, we can capture that, um, those principles and then translate them into technical requirements from a um, security, privacy, safety standpoint, we've got a set of uh, principles and then we're gonna translate those into technical requirements and we're building an architecture that allows us to keep our data safe and ensure that we're not leaking and uh, leaking data. And then we're partnering with some folks who are experts in in at the sort of infrastructure level. So we have a partnership with Microsoft. That's how we access the open AI um, technologies. We're not going directly to open AI. Um, there are other technologies that again exist at sort of the foundational level, like the BRICS level, like Databricks and Mosaic. And there are these organizations that are getting really good at fine tuning models. So we're leveraging their expertise um, to some extent. And then we are going to start experimenting and finding other partners, but we can't do it all because we don't have infinite resources. And so we are surfacing up the most important, like most potentially needle moving opportunities and use cases and the biggest problems. And then we will dedicate resources and go through a systematic pro process of identifying partners in those contexts. And then we're coming together with other health systems as well because it's really difficult for us to do this in uh, our own little bubble. Like everybody's got something to offer. Some folks have um, standardized and normalized their data and put them in a place that's actually really usable that we can work with um, together. Some folks have more access to the basic sciences because they might be affiliated with an academic medical, um, academic. So we're taking a pretty um, uh, sort of a top down and a bottoms up approach um, in, in terms of putting a system in place so that we can then engage in a really responsible way of doing this and ensure that it we take into account the science and then the safety, privacy issues, as well as the ethical equity and other issues like that. I, I like the sophistication of the approach that you outlined, um, especially the different teams that you're bringing into, the, uh, in, into these uh, decisions and evaluations early. Because especially from like a uh, ethics or safety perspective, individuals on those teams might pick up on things that other evaluators never never would have dreamed of. So it seems like yep. the kind of process that that helps keep people educated on things that they wouldn't have uh, considered before. Absolutely, education is a really big, um, really important factor here, and we're we're essentially putting together an educational program that not we're not developing all the content. We're just finding the things that are out there that are trusted sources and putting a little bit of a library together and making those resources available to our own people. And we're going to start pulling together, you know, sort of like little education videos either on our own or with partners to get the word out in terms of like what this technology is, why is it important for us to pay attention to it, what is its potential what are the risks, you know, how do we mitigate them, et cetera. Um, knowledge development and communications and education is a huge part of this. And we, we had a question in, in the chat from Dr. Keja Hein peters curious about how you're working with the clinicians or, or what kind of response you've seen from clinicians in terms of adopting or understanding these uh, AI and ML-driven applications. The response that um, I've seen is 
excitement and interest and desire to maintain uh, and sort of drive a lot of the progress uh, rather than being, you know, riding sidecar. And that's what we're working on, right? Clinicians absolutely must be in the driver's seat on a lot of this. I mean, we're helping in terms of just facilitating the conversation, but uh, but the clinicians must be in the driver's seat and they have to have the agency to be able to surface up what matters to them. A big part of what we think the potential here is, is assistive and augmenting of clinicians so that we can do things like uh, alleviating burnout. Um, I'll give one very specific example of something that is being done on my team, which is that, and folks know this, right within um, the context of the last three years as we've gotten so many folks uh, online because of covid and folks engaging in telehealth visits and stuff right the other unintended consequence was that we've seen a huge explosion in the number of in-basket messages and it's virtually impossible um, to keep up with in-basket messages as a clinician because of the sheer volume and what we have uh, started to do is put a chat bot in any digital property that Um, because of generative AI has the potential to end the large language models. We're actually using more of the LLM side rather than the generative side. We're not really doing much in the generative side yet. We're able to parse intent. So meaning we can understand if the person says something like no matter how long or how short we can tell the, you know, we can tell what they're trying to get accomplished. And then rather than them generating an in-basket message, we can actually point them to the right way to get their needs met. Like we can point them to where they can book an appointment or we can point them to where they can find information about their refills. And so, uh, so we've seen 22% um, you know, early results, 22% reduction in messages sent that were in administrative in nature that didn't need to be seen by a care team. We've seen an 8% reduction in my chart messages exclusively. And so it's just a really powerful potential uh, uh, set of tools, but our clinicians have been instrumental in ensuring that like we're adhering to all the right guidelines associated with like why we would automate, you know, this process anyway, and what what qualifies, what doesn't qualify. We don't want to do any clinical harm and like prevent someone from seeing a clinician if they really have to. And so the clinicians have been right with us the entire time as we've developed this. Again, it's like all about assisting and augmenting um, our our clinicians so that they can they can spend their time again in the highest and best use of their time. I do like the way that that you outlined a path to absorb like, Hey, which hype, uh, what's hype and and what can actually apply to us? What's real. And it's not just one person running and gunning and just taking over and and steering the ship. Yeah. We are uh, uh, a little bit past time and I'm I'm really thankful for the, for the folks that have like stayed on with us, but we always ask this one question, which I'm really curious about your answer is um, if you could change, if you're giving a magic wand that would allow you to change any single aspect of our healthcare system, what would that be? It is so hard because I have a hard time picking. This is where I can't make choices and I'm not the optimal strategic thinker. Um, but here's what I would, so I think we absolutely, uh, so you know, I'll talk about things that are not structural. I'll put it that way, because I think there are major, major structural things like the financing systems and all that. But that's, you know, that's like that's like saying, let's change the entire way that the economy is run. But what I would say is the the sense of urgency. If everyone felt urgency to solve our patients problems um, and just and recognize that like zero harm, for instance, means more than um, not making clinical errors. It's, we really just need to lean in on making accessible, affordable care, and in particular, accessible, affordable primary care for everybody. So that sense of urgency, like let's all stack hands and say, how do we do this as an industry in a sustainable way? Urgency, like just going from here to like, you know, somewhere up here, that would be the number one thing. You're on fire with that one. Zero harm means more than just not making clinical errors. That That is a, a major point, like the economics and the, the, the problems with access. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's powerful. Well, Sara, I really appreciate you uh, spending some time with us. Uh, th- this has been excellent. For the folks that want to keep hearing about these ideas, keep seeing your posts and things that that you're sharing, what's the best way that people can follow you? 
You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, that's where we try to uh, keep folks kind of engaged around um, the things that we're working on and the, the topics that matter. My little LinkedIn handle is just S-V-A-E-Z-Y at the end. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, everybody.